Well, it's good to spend some time in the Scriptures together, and uh, you're going to see in the Scriptures that we're in this morning several of the things that we've already sung about uh, just reinforced to us in some beautiful, beautiful ways about how it's finished and how we stand complete in Christ if we put our faith and trust in Him. So this morning we wrap up uh, what we've been doing the past few weeks, the words from the cross. Jesus made seven statements as He was suspended between sinful humanity and holy God as He took the, the penalty for our sins, the sins of all those who would ever believe in Him so that uh, we could be redeemed, so that we could be made right with Him. Interesting seven statements, isn't it? And we know from the Scriptures that seven is often uh, denotes a fulfill or a full or a completeness to it, even as we have seven days in a week. I put the seven statements in your bulletins, and um, just because you, you have to go between all four Gospels to put them together, and, um, and there's, there's not, there may be a little bit of a disagreement on an order of a couple of them, but there they are if you wanted them all in one place. And so over the past four weeks, we've looked at six of those statements, and this morning we want to look at the seven. So let me just walk through them very quickly, and then we'll focus on the particular one that we're looking at this morning. Jesus' first words, even maybe before he actually, uh, the cross was put upright, which seems to be words that he repeated several times, was his plea that his father would not exact the immediate penalty due to those who were crucifying and mocking him. One of the things I don't think we appreciate at all is that the moment a person sins, God would be absolutely just to strike us dead and send us to hell. And Jesus' plea was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. They do not know what they're doing. Uh, it's a plea that's based upon recognizing their ignorance, their ignorance of the holiness of God, their ignorance of their own sinfulness, their ignorance of who it was who was on the cross. And it was Jesus' plea that God would give them a chance to come to know the truth and have a chance to repent before they would have to be sent to hell to pay for their sin. Because as we said, ignorance is not innocence. Ignorance is never innocence. And so Jesus' plea was, Father, give them time. Give them time to understand and to repent and to believe so that they might be forgiven of what they are doing. His next words show the first fruit of this request as one of the criminals on the cross next to him confesses his own personal guilt, his rightful condemnation, and then looking at Jesus, recognizing Jesus' innocence, and a recognition that Jesus was, in fact, the, a king, the king of the eternal kingdom of God. And that criminal makes the request, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And we hear the second statement from Jesus the one that is most precious to anybody who's ever repented and believed, and that is today, you will be with me in paradise. The next statement comes as he sees the one whom God used to bring him into this world, his own mother. And one of the things about Jesus is he's always fulfilling all the law and in fulfillment of the fifth commandment to honor his mother, He takes care of her by putting him, her under the care of the Apostle John. And he says to her, woman, behold your son. And to John, behold your mother. 
It seems that all three of those statements were spoken in the first three hours that Jesus hung on the cross. It would have been from 9 a.m. to noon. The scriptures tell us that at noon, the sun, the sun's light was obliterated and darkness fell over the whole land. It was the middle of the day. It was Passover, the time of the full moon. This was no eclipse. This was the sun which Jesus had created, refusing to shine, so to speak. And it was dark for the next three hours, and seems like over most of the next three hours, there was absolutely no words from Jesus as he hung on the cross. I imagine only grunts and grasping for the next breath because of the torture of crucifixion as he, the eternal high priest and the Lamb of God, took in his own body the wrath of God his Father in his, as he paid for sin. I wonder if Mary and John and the others there wondered if they had heard the last words from the one that they had trusted and believed in and followed and were convinced was the Messiah. But it seems that at the very end of those three hours, Jesus utters four statements in very quick succession. Each one of them, again, him making clear of his trust in the Old Testament scriptures and what had been prophesied about him, his ongoing trust in his Father, as well as him fulfilling his part in drinking the full cup of the wrath of God to redeem people. And so he cries out, My God, My God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. And with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed the last. This morning we want to look specifically at really what what was a victory cry even as he would soon take his final breath. And that's the statement, it is finished. And we're looking at this on this resurrection morning for two main reasons. One is, it very clearly, most clearly maybe, of all the statements, captures how what was taking place on the cross was absolutely God's plan. He was still fully in charge. And he was working out the plan that was formed by God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit before the world was ever created. The second reason we do this on resurrection morning, look at this statement from the cross, is that it is really the exclamation point behind it is finished. It's like the neon sign in heaven flashing What needs to be done to save you is done. D-O-N-E, done. Done. It's done. It's done. It's finished. And it could not be fully understood how finished until resurrection Sunday morning. And boy, that is the exclamation point on it. It is not hyperbole to say that His resurrection shows the infinite nature of God's finished work on behalf of any and all who will repent and believe in Jesus as their Savior and Lord. This is no hyperbole. In fact, it's way beyond anything that we could capture. I've tried to capture it by violating every rule of punctuation. (laughs) Four exclamation points, dot, dot, dot. Just take the exclamation points on into eternity. I'm convinced we'll take them with us into heaven. It is finished. Well, let's look at the passage of Scripture 
out of which this statement is recorded for us in John chapter 19. So grab something with a copy of the scriptures on it. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, probably the easiest thing to do is grab that Bible out of the pew in front of you, and there's the page number that we're on, 1,084. But we are convinced here at Calvary that it's always good for you to see uh, what is written in the Scriptures and not just listen to me, even if I'm reading from the Scriptures. So John 19, verse 28 through 30. Let me just read it, and you'll pick up the context here. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the Scripture said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Our word finished is actually found twice in these three verses. It's translated in a lot of our translations in verse 28 as has been accomplished or had already been accomplished. It's the word accomplished. And then it is the word finished down in verse 30. It's exactly the same Greek word. Now, before we, we look more fully at what it means to be accomplished or finished, notice the link between its use in 28 and verse 30. Verse 28, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished. Verse 30, he said, it is finished. I want us to see the unique link that just shows the perfections of who Christ is between what he knows and what he says. Because with Jesus, with God, what they know always matches perfectly with what they say. What they say can always be counted upon because it comes out of a perfect knowledge. Remember the first statement that Jesus uttered from the cross? Father, what? Forgive them for what? They don't know what they're doing. See, the common stain of sin in all of us as people is we say things and do things that we don't know what we're doing or saying. They so often come out of a limited knowledge or out of, a, a, out of absolute ignorance. And it's just another way we see just in these statements from the cross the huge distinction between the one hanging on the cross and all the people gathered around, even we gathered around the foot of the cross, is we say and do things that often are wrong, inaccurate, all kinds of things. And so it's very difficult to trust anybody's word 100%, correct? Correct. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to God, what? You can always trust it, 100%. Because what he knows, he says. And what he says is always based upon his perfect knowledge. And that's why he is not only the way, he is the what? The truth. He is the truth. And it's just good to build into our lives. If Jesus said it, if the scriptures say it, it's true, I will take it as the truth and believe it and obey it. So let's look at this word finished a little bit uh, just to understand some of what it means. And if you look it up in a, a dictionary, uh, a Greek lexicon of, of Greek words anyway, you'll find three definitions. Let's walk through them quickly here. It means to complete an activity or accomplish the goal. Uh, so, for example, um, if you wanted to get to church this morning, which I'm assuming all of you did, at least adults, may not be true for children, but ad you adults, you wanted to get to church this morning, you did things uh, so that you could be here. And when you finally got here, and when you sat down in the pew, guess what you could say? It is finished. It's accomplished. I set the goal and what? 
It's finished. That particular thing is done. It's accomplished. This is the way that Paul used it at the very end of his life. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, he was about to lose his life, be put to death for his faith. And he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The word finish there is exactly this same word. And what's he saying? He says, I have kept the faith. Oh, it's been a fight. It's been a fight to keep the faith, but I have kept the faith, and therefore what? The goal I set for my life when Jesus laid hold of me, I have finished it. I finished it. And so that's one of the definitions uh, for finished. The second one is just a little bit of a different uh, take on it, and that is to fulfill an obligation which was placed upon him. So the first one has to do with something we set for ourselves. The second one has to do with something that's placed upon us, an obligation. Often this word is used specifically of uh, religious obligations. So going back to getting to church, uh, you who have children who are old enough You said, we are going to church today, and you put an obligation upon them. You go get cleaned up. You get dressed decently for church. You comb your hair, whatever else you said, but you put that obligation upon them. Now, once they had done all of that, they could have come to you and have said what? It is finished. I have fulfilled that obligation. And, uh, and so that's the way this is used. Jesus used this, uh, referring to his crucifixion, several times in the scriptures as an obligation that was placed upon him uh, in the sense of, of obeying his father. So Luke twelve fifty, I have a baptism to be baptized with, And how great is my distress until it, and here's our word, is accomplished. And so he knew that the cross was in front of him. He uses the word baptism there, and we're going to have a baptism here in a few minutes. Uh, He uses the baptism because it talks about a total identification, a total immersion into something. And, And when he hung on the cross, It was a total baptism of of he who knew no sin becoming sin and experiencing the wrath of his father in its fullness against the sin uh, of us and other people. And so he says, I'm in distress until it is accomplished. So if you think about that, when he says it is finished, what? It was the end of his distress. It was at the end of his distress, and he could give up his spirit into the hands of his father. The next one, Luke 18. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. And so here's the sense of, I have Old Testament scriptures, some have said 24 Old Testament scriptures that referred specifically to the crucifixion, and he was going to fulfill every one of those. In fact, one of the ones you looked at last week is what? I thirst. Why did he say that? Because it was written in the scriptures that he would say it. And so he said it, and that was then accomplished. And the third one there, for I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. It has its finish. Uh, it has its uh, accomplishment. And so even the fact that there's two criminals on the cross was something that was prophesied in the Old Testament about him. And so uh, it means to fulfill an obligation or responsibility. The third way this word is used is to pay what is due. Uh, in the scriptures, it's used of paying Can I say the dirty word that's due tomorrow? (laughs) Taxes. It's used three times in the Bible of paying taxes. And uh, 
Yeah, hard, it's hard to bring that up if you're not f- finished yet. <laughs> Tomorrow's the day. But, uh, it, but that's the way it's used. Now, in Greek secular writing, this uh, word, it is finished, to telestai is a Greek word, when a bill was paid in full, then it was stamped with, it is finished, to telestai, to mean it was paid in full. So if you finally pay off your car, uh, the, the, the people you have the loan with, if it was a Greek culture, would stamp it with to telestai, it is finished, and you would get the entire title to that. And now it's yours under your ownership. So think about Jesus when he says, it is finished. It is finished. He was saying, I have accomplished the goal for my earthly existence. I've accomplished the goal for which I humbled myself and left heaven and came to earth and have lived perfectly according to the law and have gone through hell over the last nine hours on this cross I have accomplished the goal I set for myself. But secondly, I have fulfilled my Father's desires and His will. I have drunk the full wrath of God against sin. There is nothing left in the cup. I have drunk it all. But thirdly, I have paid everything that is due in people's sin bills. And their debt for sin is paid in full. Nothing that they can do. Nothing left for them to pay for. Their sin is paid in full. And so it is used in all three of those senses. And so we might ask, though, what does it mean, it? It is finished. What does that mean for you and me? That's what it meant for Christ. What does it mean for us when Jesus said, it is finished. And uh, I don't know about you, but I know I was taught in writing and in preaching, do not use the word it. Always define what you're talking about. And yet right here in God's word, we have the word what? It. And you know what? This is a very appropriate use because it involves probably an infinite number of things. And any particular thing you put in this is limiting because it is everything that has to do with our salvation. Everything. So if you just say, well, my sins are paid in full, well, that's only part of it. It means heaven is, is, is the place where you're going to go to live forever. Well, yeah, but that, that's only part of it. The whole earth is going to be uh, made into a new creation. Yeah, but that's only part of it. I mean, it is such all-inclusive here. It is just, it's the fulfillment of the divine rescue plan for a hopeless humanity. It is the redemptive work which God had planned to save sinners from His holy justice so that they would be his, and they, he would be their God. And I mean, you just begin to think through the fulfillment of some of the scriptures of what this it refers to. It, according to Genesis 3.15, is Satan's bruising the heel of Jesus Christ is over, and Jesus Christ has fully crushed Satan's head. His death as a payment for sin meant Satan could not accuse the brethren anymore. The nail was now eternally driven into Satan's coffin. The it, according to Isaiah 53, 5, it means that he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be what? Whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. It's an absolute wholeness we experience. It's an absolute healing that we experience. Or according to Colossians 1, 21 and 22, the it is that we who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Jesus Christ is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death 
in order to present us holy and blameless and above reproach before him forevermore. It is everything. And if you missed all that, let's just put it this way. It means that all of the bad, all the bad news from God, and there's a lot of bad news from God if you're not under the it is finished. In fact, it's all bad news just about. I mean, God says to a person that does not know Christ and has not put their faith and trust in Him as Savior and Lord, oh, you've sinned. You fall short of my glorious perfection. Do you know the wages you've earned because of that? Death. Oh, not just physical death. Uh, you, you, you deserve a lot of death in relationships. You deserve a lot of sickness and death in your body just working up to the final death. And you think death is the end? No, now you've got to spend eternity paying for your sins under my justice. I mean, what it is finished does is it changes all the bad news into what? All the good news. The good news swallows up the bad news. And there's a day coming when we take our final breath or he comes back when there will be no remembrance of bad news. Hallelujah. What a great day that will be. And so, it is finished is the exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, dot, dot, dot. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll see this even more in a little bit of detail here. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul is just reminding the believers at Corinth and us this morning of of the difference of Christ in their lives and to not waste their lives, not to live in vain. The word vain is used four times in this chapter. And uh, so let me just read the first 11 verses and then I'll just make a couple comments here. Now, as I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that would be Peter, then to the twelve, and that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Let me just pull a couple things out of this amazing chapter. First of all, this is one of the clearest uh, descriptions of the gospel, what the gospel is there in verse uh, 3, beginning in verse 3 there. And that is that Christ died for what? Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. 
and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes through this list of personal eyewitnesses. And so what he's saying here is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ was proclaimed by the scriptures beforehand, and the resurrected Christ was seen by people afterwards. Those are the authenticating proofs acceptable to anybody about how you establish what is true and right. And so he's saying the scriptures and people, and he says some of them are still alive. Go talk to them because they have seen him. And so that's the gospel, if you will, uh, defined. And it includes the crucifixion, the fact that he was buried, and the fact that he was raised on the third day. Now, the, maybe even the more important, well, you've got to get the gospel right or the rest of it's all bankrupt. But how does the gospel work? Or to put it another way, how does a sinner live in the finished work of Jesus? How does a sinner live in the finished work of Jesus? And Paul just makes this so clear at the beginning, doesn't he? He says, I preach to you. I preach the gospel to you. Because what? You were ignorant. You had no idea. So I told you the gospel. You're sinners. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised the third day. So I, I preached that to you. And you can be sure he preached it in a lot more definition than that. But that's, that's the heart of it. And what, what did you do with it? You received it. You received it. Now, there could have been quite a process in receiving it. Some of may have received it the first time they heard it. Some, like me, are just really self-reliant and arrogant, and it takes a lot of hearing it. But finally, they received it also. What does that mean? It means they saw it as the truth they recognized it, they were convinced of it, they repented of their wrong thinking and their sinfulness, and they embraced Christ as their Savior. They received it. It's like Jesus said in the parable of the soils, the seed falls into a good heart. It just is received there. And because it was received, what happens now? In which you also what? Stand. Now that's a beautiful statement. We sang about it anyway. I'm standing. I'm standing. What does that mean? It means you're secure. You're safe. You're, you're immovable. You are. Everything's done. It's finished. You stand absolutely complete and right with the living God. Nothing else needs to be done to make you right with God. By which all also you are saved if you hold fast. Some translations say, by which you are also being saved. And that, that would talk about the ongoing work until the day you die or the day Jesus comes back. It, it's this ongoing work. And then these haunting words here. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed what? in vain. What is that talking about? That's talking about someone who heard, who received, or they thought they received, thought they were saved, but their life has wandered entirely away from Jesus. Entirely away. Now, Jesus' death was not in vain, but their thinking that they're saved is in vain. And the rest of this chapter then is an exhortation to keep believing, keep living, keep laboring. That's what the, Paul used himself as an example there, right? Uh, I am what I am in verse 10, uh, by the grace of God, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. He says, the grace of God has come to me, and I have worked to live in that grace. 
I have worked to live in the finished work of Jesus. Now, the reality is we all work. I mean, I can tell you that I have children that when I said, it's time to do the dishes, they worked to figure out how to get out of doing the dishes. Okay, so it's not an issue of some people work and some don't. I mean, there's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm working to figure out how to get more time on my phone. Or I'm working to make a ton of money so I can do whatever I want. Or I'm working to do what pleases me and makes me feel good. Or I'm working to follow Jesus and to help other people follow Him too. So it's not a question of whether some people work and some don't. Everybody works. Everybody labors. The question is, what are we laboring for? What are we laboring for? And what Paul goes on in this chapter to do is he talks about as Christ was raised from the dead, so we who believe in Him will be raised also. Verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And then he goes down in verse 50 and following and talks in great detail how this perishable will put on the imperishable. And this mortal will put on immortality and we will all be changed. And on that day, verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Just as death was swallowed up in in victory when Christ was resurrected, so when we are resurrected, all the remnants of anything to do with death and sin are swallowed up as well. And he's saying, labor to live in this reality. Labor to live in this reality. And thus the final verse of the whole chapter, therefore my beloved brethren, man, I love you. I don't want you to waste your life. I don't want you to live in vain. Be steadfast and movable, always abounding. (coughs) Excuse me. In the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so the valid question for all of us this morning is, what are we laboring for? What are we working for? We're all working for something. Are we working to live in the finished work of Jesus? Now, we're committed to that here as a church and helping each other, and we've described it in four ways. Knowing God and living our lives according to His Word. In other words, knowing Him through His Word and obeying what He says. Engaging with the other believers in God's church. And we're going to do a ministry expo next week, which will show you some of the ways that we serve each other organizing our lives to tell others people so that they might receive and be headed to heaven and in all things praising God and depending upon Him in prayer. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm so sorry. And so that's the question to each of us today. Are we laboring to live in the finished work of Jesus? It's finished. It's finished. Are we laboring to live in that finished work?